This episode is brought to you by RememberingAlife.com. Remembering the lives of people we love begins with sharing stories about the moments that meant the most to us. Whether we hold a meaningful funeral or memorial service, create a beautiful piece of art in their memory, or acknowledge special days like birthdays and anniversaries, capturing and honoring special memories helps us keep our loved ones close. Visit RememberingAlife.com for more ideas and inspiration. Welcome to the July 2022 episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast. I'm Lisa Louise Cook. Do you have an ancestor who seems to have a different birth date on every record? Help is on the way. Author Lindsay Hartner is here to help you deal with that conflicting evidence. And then in our Family History Home segment, author Rick Kroom is back to compare photo and video sharing options at the largest genealogy websites. And as I mentioned at the top of the show, uh, this episode is sponsored by RememberingAlife.com. And Gail Marquardt of the National Funeral Directors Association will stop by to tell us more about it. In our Best Websites for Genealogy segment, Allison Singleton from the Genealogy Center at the Allen County Public Library is here to tell us all about the Periodical Source Index. You might also know that as Percy. And then we're going to wrap things up at the editor's desk with e-learning producer Amanda Epperson, who's going to tell us about a big update over at Family Tree University. As always, there's a lot to cover, so let's get to it. First up is Tree Talk. Family Tree Magazine social media editor Rachel Christian has her pulse on what's trending in the world of genealogy, and she's here right now to tell us all about it. Hi, Rachel. Hi, Lisa. So what have you got your eye on this month? Well, this episode, I felt like we had to talk about one thing, and it is that Who Do You Think You Are, the U.S. Who Do You Think You Are, is coming back to NBC after 10 years of being off the air. So it's coming back. It's going to premiere Sunday, July 10th on NBC, and it will feature guests like Allison Janney, Nick Offerman, and Billy Porter. And when I shared the news on Facebook, it blew up. We had a ton of comments. And a lot of them said a similar thing, which is that even if, you know, people don't recognize the celebrities, they really love the show because they always learn something and like pick up little tips and tricks that they can use in their own research. So, and 10 years is a long time to be gone and then come back. So people are very excited about that. So again, that's pretty unusual. I know. I'm not entirely sure why it was gone for 10 years especially since it's getting such a warm welcome back. But yeah, Sunday, July 10th on NBC. Well, there you go. You never say never. And it was on for several years, and it seemed like it did pretty well. Well, that's nice. It'll be interesting to see what they might do differently, or if it's going to really be the same format. Have they announced that? No, no changes to the format that I've seen yet. But you make a really good point that, I mean, genealogy's changed a lot within the past 10 years. So that'll that'll be interesting to see how the show is maybe adapted some new methods. And a lot more people have done DNA testing. They can identify Mm -hmm. with that now if they talk about that in the show. Okay, very cool. Uh, Anything else going on in the the TV land world of genealogy? (laughs) Yeah. So one other item that's kind of trending in like the genealogy entertainment sphere. So Ancestry released a new short film. The press release calls it a docu-style film. It's only about 30 minutes. And it's called A Dream Delivered, The Lost Letters of Hawkins Wilson. And I know, I believe in our last episode, you talked with uh, Dr. Shelley Murphy about the Freedmen's Bureau. And uh, that comes up again in this, this little documentary. So basically, Hawkins Wilson was an enslaved man who was freed shortly after the Civil War. And he wrote letters to the Freedmen's Bureau asking for assistance for his siblings. But the letters were not delivered. And so this man's story kind of was left untold for many years. And so what this film does is documents the journey of using the letters to find the descendants of his siblings and bringing them together. And Dr. Henry Louis Gates is part of it. And he, you know, provides historical context as well as, you know, discusses the different tools that they used to help reunite these descendants of his siblings. And so it looks heartwarming, but also really interesting, especially if you're researching African-American ancestry. It looks like something you might want to put on your watch list. 
Well, and fascinating because it's a great example of reverse genealogy, which we mm-hmm. don't always do as often as we normally go, start with ourselves and work backwards. Here, they've started with somebody in the past and work forwards. So that's really interesting. And it's a great skill to learn. Where will folks be able to watch this film? They can watch it for free on Ancestry's website or on their YouTube channel. I will leave links in the show notes. Perfect. Well, okay. So we've got a lot of genealogy entertainment to look forward to and and, uh, enjoy. Uh, Thank you so much for bringing it to our attention, Rachel. We always appreciate it. No problem. Thanks for having me. Have you ever been frustrated by finding conflicting birth dates for your ancestor? In the new article called Birthday Wishes that appears in the July-August 2022 issue of Family Tree Magazine, professional genealogist Lindsay Harner shares five questions that you should ask yourself when you're comparing birth dates across a variety of genealogical records. And these questions will hopefully get you a little closer to the truth. Welcome to the show, Lindsay. Thank you, Lisa. I'm glad to be here. Wonderful to have you here. I think this is your first time here on the podcast, and I've just been so enjoying the article. It's always helpful when we have something to guide us through and we find conflicting information. Um, What are some of the possible reasons that we might come across birth date discrepancies when we're looking at a variety of different genealogical records? Uh, Well, when we're talking about vital records, um, and when I say vital records, I'm talking about birth, marriage, and death records. I think birth records tend to be a little different sometimes um, because you know, with marriage records, they've been recorded by churches and in civil records for many, many years and often reported in the local newspaper. Uh, death dates are often uh, carved on headstones. Um, but you know, with the birth date, I mean, no, nobody can remember their own birth date, right? So in the days before, in the days before documentation, a lot of times people only had to, they relied on what they were told by, you know, maybe a parent or a relative in, in terms of what their actual birth date was. That's a good point. It, it poses a very unique challenge. Well, Let's jump into your your five questions, because I think they're really great questions for us to be asking ourselves. Um, What's the first thing that we should ask ourselves when we're seeing a discrepancy? Well, the first question you should ask yourself is, when was the record created? Records tend to be more reliable the closer they were created to the actual event. Um, People tend to remember events better when they're fresher in their minds. You know, we can, um, we tend to remember things better that happened last week than say 10 years ago. (laughs) That's a very, very good point. And question number two, where does that lead us? The next thing you're going to want to look at is who was the source of the birth information? Was it someone who could have been present at the birth, uh, they're going to be the most reliable sources of the information, such as a parent, a grandparent, aunt or uncle, uh, maybe an older sibling who would have been old enough to remember, um, an attending physician or midwife, if you're lucky enough to uh, to find a record from one of them. Um, but people like that would be much more reliable than, say, uh, the person's child who of course, couldn't have been present at the birth. As you talk about that, I think about, I'm looking at a death certificate. Uh, They often will tell the birth date of the person who died. And then you look at the informant and you you go, oh, well, that guy certainly wasn't there and probably heard it second or third hand. So Mm -hmm. that's what you're talking about, kind of deciding how much weight to give it. That's right. Yes. And um, the next question you're going to want to ask is, uh, whether or not the birth date can be corroborated with other records. Um, it, for example, if you have three records that report one birth date and then you find another record that gives a completely different birth date, chances are the record that has that, uh, the one record that differs from everything else, that's probably not accurate if you can't find anything else that, that matches it. So if one thing is standing out as kind of the lone ranger of misinformation and everything else seems to be lining up, then 
we weigh it that way. That makes yeah. sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I imagine that there are some dates out there that just don't make sense, right? Does that lead us to question number four? Yes, that that's right. So you're going to want to take into consideration uh, Everything that you know about the person when you have conflicting information like this, you're going to want to look at all of the records you have related to them and, and their immediate family. And that should clue you in onto whether or not a certain birthday is even plausible or makes sense. Um, for example, if someone's listed in the 1860 census, well, they couldn't have been born in 1861 or later. Or if they have, you know, they had an older brother who was born in 1875, they they needed to, uh, their birth date would have to be at least nine months after the older sibling's birth date. You know, and that sounds logical, but it's funny when you're in the heat of, of a, a challenge, sometimes it's easy to lose sight of those very simple ways to just mm-hmm. kind of check that out. And then we have your final and fifth question. Uh, What else should we be asking ourselves? The last question um, that I I recommend you ask yourself in this situation is, is there a reason that the source would be dishonest? Um, There's lots of reasons why someone may have lied about their age. Um, I'm sure most of us have heard about boys claiming to be older than they actually are in, ol- in order to be eligible for military service. Um, I have, um, s- s- some people may have lied just for the sake of appearances. Um, for example, I-, I can think of an instance in my own family tree where I have a female ancestor who was about seven or eight years older than her husband. And, uh, you know, once they were married, all of a sudden her, her birth year in census records became much later, <laughs> you know, because she, you know, she didn't apparently didn't want people to know she was so much older than her husband, or they just assumed that they were closer in age. Um, so, so that's one reason why someone could be dishonest or if, if they had a financial incentive to be dishonest, uh, that could be another reason. Um, I know my, my grandfather, he uh, he got his driver's license when he was 15. He lied about his age, and for many years, his driver's license had the, had the wrong age on it. You know, there, there's all sorts of, of reasons that people could lie. So uh, you'll just want to ask yourself, you know, is is there a reason? Did they stand to gain something from being dishonest? That's a very good point. It makes me think back, if anybody ever finds my... Um, first job application, they will find a, a bit of a lie on the on the age because I was really anxious to get to work. So I, I was 15. And I said I was 16 and a different year. But I don't do that anymore. Um, something else, you know, when we're looking at these kinds of records, and you were talking about finding additional records to corroborate what we're finding. Um, what are some of the birth record substitutes that we could be looking for? Yes, fortunately, even in the years before state-issued uh, birth certificates, there are a lot of other sources that we can turn to that would give a birth date. Probably the best sources out there would be a, a family Bible or a baptismal record. Chances are they were created very close to the birth, um, not very long after, Um if your ancestor lost a parent at a young age, there may be guardianship records out there that would record their birth date. If your ancestor served in the military, there could be various military records, enlistment records, pension records, World War One, World War Two draft registration cards. Uh, th- they would record birth dates. Um, they're both available on Ancestry. Headstones, um, older headstones often, they might not record a birth date, um, but I've seen many where they'll record the death date and give the person's age, a very specific age in years, days, and months. And so even if it doesn't record the actual birth date, you can record the birth date. Uh, so that's another option. Uh, there's death certificates, obituaries, 
And there's, there's also many records that record a person's age at the time that the record was created. Census records are, of course, a big one, marriage records. And you can use those to calculate, um, help calculate a range of when their birth may have occurred. The article, again, is called Birthday Wishes. It is in the July and August 2022 20, issue of Family Tree Magazine. Uh, tell folks, Lindsay, where they can find you and what you're up to these days. Well, I focus on Pennsylvania and New York research, primarily 19th, 20th century uh, research. So I'm always busy working on that. Um, and you can find me on my website at www.lindsayshistories.com. I also have a blog there that you can uh, check out and read more about my research. Excellent. Well, Lindsay Hartner, thank you so much for being on the show today. Appreciate it. Thanks, Lisa. Sharing photos and videos online will help you preserve your family's stories as well as draw relatives into your research. And contributing editor Rick Kroom is here to talk about where and how to share your important mementos online. Welcome back, Rick. It is always nice to have you here on the podcast. Hi, Lisa. It's always fun to be interviewed. Well, I I love your article. It's called Show and Tell and aptly named here because we want to show and and, uh, share our photos and our videos. This is in the July-August 2022 issue of Family Tree Magazine. And you really help us navigate our way through this online photo sharing. And I can see that there are several places where we could choose to share our photos online. Let's start with the top three, the, the big genealogy websites, Family Search, Ancestry, and MyHeritage. Can we share our photos on these for free, even if we don't have a paid subscription? Yes, you can create a family tree and share photos for free on all three of those websites. You don't need a paid subscription. Boy, that's terrific. So is there going to be a file limit? I think about this when we're scanning our photos, oftentimes we're going for some high resolution. What are some of the limits as far as how big our images can be? Yes, both Ancestry and Family Search limit the size of a single photo or document file to 15 megabytes. My Heritage has a larger file size limit, 50 megabytes, but if all of your photo and document files exceed 500 megabytes, you'll need a paid subscription. I usually find that that 15 megabyte limit works well. I often submit a TIFF file because that seems like higher quality than JPEG file. But if the TIFF file would be larger than 15 megabytes, then I use a JPEG file. Right. And, you know, the TIFF files being the uncompressed and and a JPEG being a little more compressed, I would think for online sharing, um, it would be okay to go with the, the smaller JPEG, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, though I guess I view, let's say, the Family Search Family Tree and Family Search Memories especially as a way to permanently preserve my family photos. So I also want to oh. make sure they're good quality. That's a great point. So not only are we sharing, but but really in particular in the case of Family Search, this could be more of a long-term high-end kind of storage for us, a backup. Maybe those uh, larger, more high-resolution files are the way to go. Yes, I think so. So they have a 15 megabyte limit. Okay. That's right. On my heritage, the file size limit is much larger, 50 megabytes. So you're unlikely to have a single photo file that would be larger than that. Perfect. So we're sharing our photos with our relatives. Um, and of course, they might not know all the faces in the photographs like we do if we're doing all the research. Which one of these websites allow us to tag the faces so we can let people know who's who. You can tag faces in photos on both Family Search and My Heritage, but not on Ancestry. On all three of the sites, though, you can also add a description of the photo so you can include names there, and and you should do that. And also keep in mind that all three of these sites let you link photos to people in a family tree. Oh, that's neat. So it really enhances the tree, kind of brings the, the names to life with the faces. That's right. 
Okay, so we can tag them. Um, I'm thinking about after putting a lot of photos up there, then we're going to deal with have to deal with organization. What kind of opportunities do they give us to to keep these photographs organized? Um, Family Search lets you organize photos and records into albums. And for example, I created eight albums, one for each of my great grandparents and their relatives. And I find it especially useful to share links to those albums. Someone can see all of my key photos and records, too, for one branch of my family by viewing those albums. And again, they're linked to profiles of people in Family Search Family Tree, so people can easily follow those links to get more details on the people in the photos. And they can even see how they're related to people in those photos if the people viewing them have linked themselves to profiles in the Family Search family tree. And so that's Family Search. Then there's My Heritage. You can also organize your photos into albums on My Heritage, and you can share a link to an album on My Heritage too. So it works a lot like Family Search. Terrific. Now, we've been talking about photos. But you mentioned videos in this article as well. Do any of these websites support us uploading our video? Uh, My Heritage is the only one of these three websites that lets you upload videos. But keep in mind that a free family site on My Heritage can have only up to 500 megabytes of photos and scanned documents. So if all of your files on your family site exceed 500 megabytes, then you'll need a paid subscription. And video files tend to be large, so they could quickly use up your 500 megabytes of free storage space. And at that point, you'd need to get a paid subscription to get more storage space. Okay, that's really good to know. You're, you're absolutely right. Video files are huge. And, in, and I know for myself, I've been digitizing a lot of my old home movies. So it would be kind of fun to be able to attach those to the tree or like in the My Heritage case, uh, the family website they kind of create for it. So that's really neat. Okay. So I, I, we've been kind of talking about the comparing them head to head. And I know in the article, you have a terrific kind of an at a glance comparison chart. Um, I can see right now just looking at this and talking about it, it sounds like family search kind of rises to the top a little bit in terms of the cost and the flexibility and the options. Is that kind of where you came out on this? Yes, indeed. Um, I really like the way Family Search displays albums. I like the way you can browse all of the images in an album and click on one of those images to view a full-size image and the way you can describe the dates, places, and add a description to each of those images, and then even follow a link to the Family Search family tree. And all of that is free. So I have found that Family Search really is my favorite of these three websites for sharing family photos and old documents, too. Right, because the documents are scanned images as well, right? Right. I also include scanned images of things like family Bibles and diaries and other family records along in those same albums. So um, so I can give somebody a link to, let's say, all of my key documents and photos for the Robertson side of my family by just giving them a link to my Robertson album on Family Search. I could also mention that one thing I really like about my heritage, though, are its photo editing tools, including the ones to colorize photos automatically and sharpen photos. They're really easy to use. And I also like a new feature, on pretty new feature on my heritage called Live Story that automatically draws on events and photos in your family tree to create an animation about an ancestor. And it even adds a narration. So you can have your ancestor narrate photos and documents relating to his or her life. I find it really fascinating and fun to watch, though the word some people use to describe it is creepy. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a, it's a personal preference, isn't it? Right. <laughs> but it's neat that they're giving us some creative options for, for sharing our photos and our, our documents and, and videos in and, and some really cool and innovative ways. Yes, I agree. 
each of these websites has you know something to offer or something unique, so it's worth taking advantage of the best features of each one of them. Great point. So we've been talking about the big three websites, MyHeritage, Ancestry, and Family Search. Where else do you recommend that we might upload and share our photos? Although you can't link your photos to family trees using them, mainstream photo sharing sites offer many tools for editing, organizing, and sharing your photos and videos. On Facebook, for example, you can upload photos and videos and create albums. A lot of your friends and relatives are probably on Facebook already, so that's a good way to share photos and videos with them. Um, Google Drive gives you 15 gigabytes of free storage for photos and other files. And Google Photos uses artificial intelligence to categorize your photos and recognize faces. And you can create albums to share with family and friends. Other photo sharing sites include Amazon Photos, Apple iCloud Photos, Flickr, and PhotoBucket. All of them might be better options for sharing videos than the big genealogy websites. Great. Wow, we have so many options to choose from, and you've really outlined them for us uh, here in this article. It's called Show and Tell. It's in the July-August 2022 issue of Family Tree Magazine. And Rick Kroom, thank you so much for just making this job just a little bit easier. We appreciate it. Thanks, Lisa. It was a pleasure chatting with you. As you heard at the top of the show, this episode is sponsored by RememberingAlife.com. And here to tell us more about it is Gail Marquardt. She is the Vice President of Consumer Engagement for the National Funeral Directors Association. Welcome back to the show, Gail. Hi, thank you so much for having me again. It's great to be here. Well, thank you. You know, I was thinking about that being summertime, a lot of families are out and about attending family reunions, and they have some opportunities to be able to meet up with relatives they haven't maybe seen for a while or much older relatives. How might they use your Remembering a Life website to kind of help start conversation? Oh, this is a great time to have conversations with people. Um, whether you start to have a conversation with people at a family reunion or maybe even a backyard cookout, it's a great time to engage with maybe some of the relatives you don't see very often, especially some of the older relatives who have all the really great, wonderful stories that they can share. My mom recently told me about all the photos that she has collected. She's kind of the family archivist and she has photos going back, you know, more than a hundred years of relatives. Now is the time You know, she's 91. Now is the time to start documenting what are these photos, who are these people. Take them to the family reunion and invite people to engage with them. Invite people to bring their own photos. Um, maybe, Maybe create a family photo album and give people the opportunity to write stories within that album as kind of a family history. Storytelling is one of those things that gets harder and harder to do as people are no longer with us. And those gatherings are a perfect time to share those stories. Absolutely. I totally agree. And the website, which is at rememberingalife.com, I see honoring a life right here in the menu. So when we click that, you've got some great conversation starters for us, don't you? Right. We have conversation starters. We also have ways that you can use those stories creatively, whether it's an art project or something you might do in nature. There are very creative ways to take those stories and make them a living legacy for future generations. But definitely getting the conversation started is the first step. And we have conversation starters out on our website. We also have Have the Talk of a Lifetime conversation cards that make it really easy to have a conversation with your loved ones. Well, a lot of terrific resources. You can find them all at rememberingalife.com. Gail Marquardt, thanks so much. Great to talk to you. Thank you. Would you like to be able to search millions of genealogy articles for free? then you are in the right place because today we are digging into the periodical source index known as PERSI. 
<laughs> I'm Lisa Louise Cook, and this is Genealogy Gems. And here to tell us more about Percy is Allison Singleton. She is the Acting Genealogy Services Manager at the Genealogy Center at the Allen County Public Library in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Hi, Allison. Hi, thank you for having me. Thank you so much for being here. I knew when I wanted to talk about Percy here on the show, the person to talk to would be Allison, because you guys are really the hub of all things Percy. So I'm excited to have you here today. And I think we probably need to start at the beginning, which is, what is Percy? Sure, let's get right into it. Percy, the periodical source index, is an index that we create in-house and it indexes periodicals from all over the world. These are periodicals such as newsletters, quarterlies, they could be anything from genealogical society publications, they could be special interest group publications, um, surname, family society publications, ethnic society publications, so it's a little bit of everything. And what we're doing is we are indexing the titles of those articles. It's a subject index, and it's full of amazing pieces of information that a lot of people don't have access to from home otherwise. So we're able to take that information that people boots on the ground, either in the locations where these publications are from, or if these are publications that are very specific and they dive into a topic really deep, They're the experts, the subject experts, and you're able to get the information from the people who know the most, which is invaluable as researchers. I absolutely love going through these different records. Um, So the different things that you'll find are maybe Bible records, maybe you'll find some source materials, ancestor charts, perhaps it'll be a transcription of original records. You know, in fact, somebody actually found a transcription of records that later burned in a fire. Oh, wow. That's, that would be amazing. Yeah. So that was a very exciting day. There were tears. It was awesome. Yeah. So you never know what you can find. Now, I don't guarantee that everybody's going to find a gem like that, but there is hope. There's hope to break through some brick walls, maybe get some research techniques, or at least learn about some different people who are doing research on the same topics as you. Exactly. And Allison, a lot of these periodicals could be quite old, couldn't they? I mean, I think about genealogy society newsletters. Those have been around well before we ever got online and started sharing information on the internet. So are those included as well? 100%. We have periodicals that go back to the 1800s, and it's pretty amazing to go through some of the results. I really enjoy being able to show someone that somebody's already written something on their family history. Back before they were ever a thought, their parents were a thought, even grandparents were a thought. Terrific. So these are articles, and you said it was a name index search. So um, we've been talking a lot about indexing these days with the 1950 census, and people are very aware that they're going through and, and grabbing pieces of information out of the census. Well, this is sounds like it's the same with these articles. So um, we may not necessarily search on the name of an ancestor versus a topic or a place. Would that be fair to say? It's a mix. So when articles are written, it's the title of that article that are typically indexed. The exception is if somebody names an article something like, oh, bones, and you don't know exactly what that is, the indexers will put in that it's cemetery records. But it's basically just going to go by the titles of those articles, and not all of us have articles written specifically about our ancestors. So I would recommend doing a surname search, but also doing a location search, a topic search. There's a lot of different types of searches you can do. We can dive a little bit deeper into that later, or anybody can contact us. We would love to talk to anyone who wants to dive into Percy a little bit deeper. Awesome. So now you're at the Genealogy Center 
which is a, a specialty kind of section of the Allen County Public Library in Fort Wayne, Indiana. And you guys have an extensive genealogy website we've talked about here at Genealogy Gems. Um, tell us about specifically what we're going to find at the Genealogy Center website. How do we access and do these searches that you're talking about of Percy? Yes, of course. So if you go to our website, genealogycenter.org, there is a green button on the left-hand side, if you scroll down a smidge, called Our Resources. Once you click on that, there's two options. There's free databases and there's on-site databases. The free databases are the ones that you can access from anywhere in the world at any time of the day. And those are the ones you want to click on. Once you get that drop-down menu, go to Percy, start your searches. Terrific. And I've seen that there's a lot of different um, buttons on the home page. Where do you typically start? Does it depend on what your genealogy question and plan is? Or do you have one favorite kind of starting place for your searches? It depends on what my research question is. Typically, Mm -hmm. I do like to do a surname search first, just to see if I'm lucky enough to have a article for the surname I'm looking for, uh, whether it be a personal research uh, problem that I'm working on or if it's something for a customer. You never know what can pop up. Once I've finished with that, I then go to the location and start diving a little bit deeper. And I'm usually looking for an event. And so I want to search for all the different search terms that I can think of that surround a specific event. For example, if I'm looking for maybe a death event, I'm going to look up the word death, died, um, see here, burial, funeral, probate, wills, cemetery, anything, anything that has to do with a surrounding a death event is what I'm going to look for. It's not just one word. You're not going to look and just say, well, I, I want something on the death. It should just come up under death. No, it's going to come up under anything the author thought of to call it. And some of them get pretty clever, which is interesting, but unhelpful. Terrific. Well, you've really whetted our appetite for these really one-of-a-kind kinds of articles that are over at Percy. How do we get access to the article once we've found it in the index? That is the beautiful part. You have multiple options. The first option would be to contact the publisher. I usually recommend going to the source when you want something. Um, And many times if you contact a publisher, especially if it's a smaller periodical um, or even a local one, you might be able to just find it online. Perhaps they've been digitizing their own or perhaps someone would give you a copy pretty easily. Sometimes there's a nominal fee. Another option is to put the periodical title into WorldCat. WorldCat.org if you're unfamiliar with it. It's an excellent research tool for genealogists because you can find where a local copy of that periodical would be and maybe get it in our library loan or go to your local library where they have it. And lastly, but not least, you can order it from us. There is a nominal fee and you do get to fill out a form, which is not always fun, but we will fill your request as quickly as we can. But give us about mm, four to six weeks. (laughs) Wow, terrific. Okay, so... That is a quick overview of Percy, which again is the Periodical Source Index. And this is your access point to so many one-of-a-kind articles. And uh, everybody over at the Genealogy Center in Allen County Public Library is there to help you. It's exciting to know that there are several different ways to get access to these really one-of-a-kind records in so many cases. And you can find out more information at genealogycenter.org and Allison Singleton, thank you so much for opening up the world of periodical articles for our genealogy research. Thanks again. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Well, it's time to stop by the editor's desk. And today we're going to be talking with the e-learning producer, Amanda Epperson, about what's new over at Family Tree University. Welcome back, Amanda. Hi, Lisa. I'm glad to be here today. You know, it sounds like you've been pretty busy there over at Family Tree University. There's a lot of new stuff in the works. Tell us about it. 
Yes, Lisa, we have been quite busy at Family Tree University this morning preparing a new campus for our university. So it'll be all the same courses, but it may look a little bit different to you. So it has a cleaner, simpler, what you would call a course player, where you see the information in the videos and the text. And it has on the right-hand side a much larger, I think more... Um, a course menu that is much easier to navigate. And one of the things I like the best is it now has more visible discussion area where discussions can be threaded. So um, you can open up that area and start a tile basically with a title with your question and type your information and then post it. And then that same tile can be opened and have the replies put into it so it'll be easier for you to find and I think for others people to reply because often that's one of the great things about our courses is students can reply to each other and help each other out so I think it'll be um, a much more visible and um, more organized way to have um, the discussions in our courses because we really value that. I really agree. I think the course discussion, it's one of the real benefits of of doing an online course at Family Tree University because I know as an instructor, um, I really like seeing the questions. It helps me know, you know, what people are focused on, what they want to uh, achieve. And, And then when they ask a question and we get some answers out for them, everybody gets to benefit from it. So I'm excited about the threading feature. It's going to make it so much easier to really not only get the most out of the course, but really get the most out of all that discussion and the Q&A that goes on in the discussion forum. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that that works out well, because I'm excited about it. So I imagine I know I've got a course just around the corner, there are several coming up. So people have uh, Mm -hmm. new courses to dig into, and a new platform, which courses are coming up here next? Well, and starting on July 18th is your course Google search success for genealogy, which helps you use the Google search platform to find your ancestors and the best tips and tricks for doing that in the most organized way. Um, And some useful, I think, search tips that would actually help you search anywhere, you know, not just on Google. And then coming up after that is the cluster and collateral genealogy, which is researching genealogy um, clusters or networks. So um, expanding just beyond your direct ancestor and researching their friends and families and neighbors to help you figure out how to find out what your questions, like where they came from or who they they married or a woman's maiden name. All those questions can often be answered by researching a group of people. And then coming up in August, we have several popular courses. So become a family search power user is first up in August and then recruit and then U.S. land records, how to use them for family history. And then after that is find your Italian ancestors. And then we have a get started course. So instead of having a back to school, we have get back to genealogy basics with get started with genealogy. And then finally, in August, we have become a family history detective, which helps you analyze and dive deeper into documents. Wow, there's something for everybody and a new platform to boot. So uh, there is. is. Yeah. In the show notes for this podcast episode, uh, we'll have links to Family Tree University, a list of all those courses that Amanda just mentioned. And uh, I am really excited about working on the new platform. Thank you so much, Amanda, for continuing to bring us such uh, wonderful education opportunities. We appreciate it. Thank you, Lisa. I'm glad to share them. Thanks again for joining me for the July 2022 episode of the Family Tree Magazine podcast, the podcast from America's number one genealogy magazine. As always, I'm going to have a show notes page for you with everything we talked about. You can find the show notes at familytreemagazine.com slash podcast. And while you're over on the website, be sure and sign up for the free newsletter as well. If you happen to be listening through a podcast app, uh, we would really appreciate a five-star review if you're enjoying this show. And while you're there, you can also check out my Genealogy Gems podcast. I'm Lisa Louise Cook. You can visit me at genealogygems.com. And until next time, have fun climbing your family tree.